Hello and welcome to the Temple Mount Podcast. My name is Shogun. Today we have an audio recording, first ever, of the Book of the Void, by way of deception. The Octopus Book of War, Volume 1 of 12. Before I get started, please make sure you've joined us on the Temple Mount Discord server and subscribe to the Temple Mount official YouTube channel for all of our past and future podcasts coming out every day at about 8 p.m. Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for war. Psalms 18.34 War is by its very nature deception, master son. Be like water. Water becomes the shape of whatever container it is poured into. Pour water into a teapot and it becomes a teapot. Pour water into a vase and it becomes a vase. Bruce Lee. Drag your opponent into deep waters and drown him there. UFC and MMA proverb. Generally speaking, the way of the warrior, Bushido, is resolute acceptance of death. That is what separates the warrior caste from the householder caste and the householder merchant and prince. They seek safety, or at least the illusion of it. They seek to surround themselves with the trappings of safety and security. Wealth, honor, retainers, high walls, bodyguards, men-at-arms, treasuries and possessions, titles, holdings, and full granaries. Only the Bushi seeks the opposite of safety. He willingly goes away or surrenders all that he has, while others like to grasp and hold. The octopus seeks ever to give away, to leave behind a trail of treasures like the scales of the golden dragon, which seem like dropped gold coins. Whatever an octopus loses, drops, or has stolen from him is indelibly marked. Anyone who finds him, her, or themselves in possession of one of these stolen treasures soon finds the dropped egg, scale, or coin manifests as an entire righteous golden dragon, Greek dracon, Hebrew Elohim, or Bene Elohim, demanding an accounting in full. Woe betide the one who harms or kills the egg or young of an octopus. The way of war of an octopus is thus. The VPN is the honeypot, and the honeypot is the firewall. The golden dracon hunts by losing. It pretends to scatter its treasure absentmindedly, as though so unconcerned by its vast wealth as to be giving it away freely. The golden dracon leaves, leaves a treasure trail, like onto that left by the most unique of bunnies, the Easter bunny. But woe betide those who would steal candy from the mouths of babes, or present meat, or present presents meant from children. The most benevolent golden dracon is the most ferocious guardian of its wealth as it is the most protective of mothers. She sacrifices her own life to defend her young and eggs until they are strong enough to swim and to hide for themselves. Likewise, the most vengeful father and guardian is the male octopus, or male golden dracon, who will relentlessly hunt down, track, and assassinate any who dares bring even one of his 10,000 young to harm. With an implacable and inerrant hunter's and killer's instinct, as the great gold lion will come racing to scatter the yipping hyenas, who dare interfere with his pride, his harem of deadly huntresses, or wives. The octopus way of war is like unto that of the Calid clade. Just as the polymorphine drug used by a Calidus allows her or him to assume any form, fit through any crack, and mask itself in any shape or color, perfectly mimicking its environment, so the octopus is like unto a ninja, capable of laying in wait for its prey for months, years, or even decades, until a certain tr signal, trigger, or sign invokes its wrath. In this way, the octopus is similar to a Vindicare clade assassin, capable of hanging upside down for decades, waiting for the one perfect shot that can end a rebellion dead in its tracks, just as a praying mantis may do, and by doing so is able to slay and feed on prey many times its own size, such as a full-grown bird. Both the mantis, mimic octopus, and calidus have mastered the most deadly arts of war. Humility, patience, self-sacrifice, resolute acceptance of death, ambush, and deception. For as the art of war teaches, the essence of war is deception, master son. The mimic octopus, like all assassin clades or temples, as euthanatos or the good death, is indeed a holy thing. A good death delivered artfully and cleanly is sacred. And both octopus and the mantis, especially the flower or orchid mantis, has mastered the art of deceit, camouflage, of dazzle camouflage, while the crass and vulgar wasp or even the rightly feared black widow advertises its lethal venom by bright garish coloration, yellow and black stripes, or a bright red hourglass in the... in the... 
carapace of the widow. The mimic octopus or flower mantis seeks to blend perfectly into the environment, especially a food-rich environment appealing to its prey. Just as the lurking crocodile appears only to be a harmless floating log in a watering hole, so that it does not raise the suspicions of the gazelle thirsting who are its prey, or how the Calidus assassin so often appears as a beautiful and nubile young woman or man who draws its chosen human prey's loneliness or sexual lust, thirst, in common parlance. So the flower mantis appears to be a nectar-rich flower or orchid, enticing to the pollinating insects on which it must predate. Predate. Predation also refers to the ability of the three-eyed octopus or mantis to not only see the future precognitively ascertaining where its desired target will appear, it predates its foe by occupying an advanced position in time. The foe who is literally existing in a past space-time position is helpless before the deadly trap the mantis or octopus has laid for it in its future. Even if forewarned, it is unable to direct the course of its own future, for the predator in the future is the master, the maestro, the orchestrator, who plays the tune, the rhythm, the melody, the lyric that, like a siren, lures helpless sailors to shipwreck. Of course, the queen or king octopus, although itself a deadly hunter, is only a tiny reflection of the kraken or giant octopus, which can break a ship's mast by its might or pull its hull asunder by its own main strength, attacking not only from below, but also through encompassing by its eight tentacles. The void kraken of space likewise can rend even an imperial battleship in twain by its colossal size and power. But size and strength are the lowest aspects of the art of war, which is, after all, the art and science of skillful, skillful euthanados, bringing the gift of a good death. Even the tiniest paper cut infected can spread to the heart of the host in a day or less, and the deadly nightshade or adder's venom can slay an elephant with a mere thimbleful. The humble ant can strip clean a worm or maggot a hundredfold its size, and even the mighty whale is a glorious banquet for the humble crabs and worms for whom such a leviathan's fall is a heaven-sent or brought gift. Humans have a saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, and such an aphorism, however crude, holds veracity. The large, by virtue of its size, is blind to the threat of the deadly but small. Through infection, contagion, venom, or the proverbial death by a thousand cuts, the Goliaths of the universe may become mere sustenance for the Davids. Even the mighty red dragon, large, largest of the chromatic kind, can be flayed, dried, and salted by a coordinated force of predators so small that the mighty dragon neither sees their approach nor has any response to the host of external, perhaps nanotechnological or nanobiological paper cuts, devouring it cell by cell, just as a strong man is made to dance by grave discomfort by the proverbial ants in his pants, or the 10,000 spider or wasp larvae hatching from within. Like the eyelash viper, the brown recluse or the fertile ants, the correct poison makes a mockery of size and bulk, muscle, shell, or scale. Just as the vanadum clade knows so well, a tasteless, touchless, odorless venom, poison, or gas can kill one or a billion with ease. All that is required is the right, correct route of administration. How can a tyrant or despot sleep at night, not knowing if the man or woman lying beside him is a mantis, an octopus, or a calidus, waiting to deliver the fatal dart, perhaps a comely hairpin soaked in deadliest nightshade? Or if her intoxicating perfume is in fact most lethal belladonna? The mantis knows well that love and lust are the most deadly poisons of all. How many kings, tyrants, and autocrats fell sweet, sweetly, sweetly to sleep in love's embrace, never to wake to light of day again? How much more so the nefarious predator, whose secret delight comes in the smallest, most innocent form? Know they not that even the comely may be an assassin most carefully and venomously trained to deliver poison, gentle or cruel, behind a thick veil of secrecy the predator himself has so carefully spun? When you think you are the spider, gloating over the juicy fly, moth, or butterfly, Snared in your web, know you not that the sticky threads of your trap may be merely the proverbial or actual honeypot or wasp trap in which you yourself are caught? After all, one catches more flies with honey than with vinegar, and the same nectar that entices the hummingbird drowns the cruel and honorless wasp. Beware, O ye, who seek secrecy and privacy behind which to commit your secret vice, and for which you pay so high a precious price. For secrecy and duper's delight is perhaps the greatest intoxication, and those who are intoxicated by a false sense of power tend to miss the deadly death concealed within the humble flower or baby rose. Every rose has its thorn, and every hell's bell or angel's trumpet, its breath worse by far than death. And so for those who would pick a fair rosebud before it's time to bloom or stop the smell of a fragrant blossom, 
Take care of the smell you inhale with such glee is not that of your own doom. You see, there are fates far worse than dying, hence the grateful dead. For some crimes, death is too merciful a fate. The Calexis know this well, which is why to lose your very soul can be a fate far worse than hell. Fear itself is also a great weapon when cowards are your foe. And so, to make a gruesome example of many is the art the Eversore well know. But the cleanest kill of all is the one that others make in your stead with no knowledge of your incitement. Knowledge is power, and he with knowledge and power holds death in both his hands, or hers. Beware of the one who wears black and pink diamonds. The art of death is not only found in fist and knife or gun. Information itself is a weapon, and without it few battles are won. There is a final clade of assassination more lethal and potent perhaps than all others combined, but we speak not of it. For to know will destroy and endanger the soul. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. 1 Timothy 1, chapter 8, verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous man, but for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and mothers, and for manslayers and slayers of women and children. This has been the first reading of the Mantis and Octopus Book of War. It's actually called the Book of the Void by way of deception, the Octopus Book of War, Volume 1 of 12. And the other ones will be made available at the earliest possible time. Please make sure that you have listened to the uh, previous podcasts and subscribe to the Temple Mount YouTube channel and join the Temple Mount Discord server where we record this podcast every day at 8 p.m. I noticed that some people have joined since we began. Does anyone have any questions or comments uh, if you heard some of that? All right, then. Uh, thank you for joining me. And uh, if you missed the beginning or you want to hear the whole thing, which I recommend, it will be as soon as possible. So that will conclude this podcast. Thank you for joining us. Remember, do not take the mark of the beast. And please join, uh, join me now in the Temple Mount Tavern for the rest of the evening.